This podcast is a production of Open Pediatrics, a free online resource for health professionals' education. Visit openpediatrics.org for more. Well, hello and welcome to the Open Pediatrics World Shared Practice Forum. I'm Tracy Wilbrink, a pediatric intensivist at Boston Children's Hospital and co-director of Open Pediatrics. I'm honored to be here today with Dr. Erica Fink. Dr. Fink is an associate professor of critical care medicine and pediatrics at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. She's also the associate director of the Saffir Center for Resuscitation Research. Erica is an attending physician in the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh and director of the Critical Illness Recovery for Children program. Dr. Fink's research is focused on resuscitation, neurocritical care, and outcomes and recovery of children with critical illness. Dr. Fink is the principal investigator on the NIH-funded multi-center personalizing outcomes after pediatric cardiac arrest study and co-PI of the multinational GCS NeuroCOVID Consortium, the pediatric arm. She is a co-PI for her site's participation in the CAPCORN. Welcome, Erica. Thank you so much, Tracy. It's so nice to be here. Well, evident from my introduction, you conduct research on lots of topics related to resuscitation and neurocritical care. But I was hoping today we could focus our talk on your work related to the Pangea Research Program, which stands for the Prevalence in Acute Critical Neurological Disease in Children, a Global Epidemiological Assessment. Does that sound okay with you today? That sounds like fun. <laughs> Perfect. So let's get started. Why did you and your colleagues start Pangea? What were your goals? What were you hoping to accomplish? Yes, it all started back when I was a younger faculty member and incredibly optimistic about the future and making a difference in the world for kids and families, particularly with neurocritical illness, as that was becoming my clinical and research focus. I also have been inspired by so many great mentors here in neurocritical care and elsewhere, as you might note, Dr. Tasker's part of this group. And I had been attending WIFPIX World Congresses in various places, and I was inspired by our colleagues around the world who attended and presented from their perspectives. Also, I was inspired by Polisi, and I can dig a little more into that as well. I had been attending Polisi for several years, despite not having any multi-center trials. I had my career development grant in pediatric cardiac arrest, and I was enrolling in trials. And in the meantime, ideas were percolating. And I had recently read about Dr. Vincent's EPIC study of adults critical sepsis is a point prevalence study in JAMA. And I was intrigued by those methods and really interested to see that Philippe Gervais from Canada had performed a point prevalence study with Miriam Sanchi to analyze how children were ventilated who had acute respiratory failure. This was in the days back when adult CCM investigators discovered the benefits of low tidal volume to improve outcomes. This seemed like a really useful mechanism to really understand the scope of pediatric neurocritical illness to inform future research trials, also perhaps to advocate for more resources for these topics. So thus Pangea was born. And coming up with that acronym was not easy, but I really love it. (laughs) It really speaks to the global nature of what was intended. So Philippe and Miriam and Polisi in general were really vital in vetting the study design. I presented several times, and we decided to really split this into two studies, one that focused on more highly resourced countries and one that focused on less resourced regions, mainly because the research questions and the structure really had to fit the situation. They also helped me garner buy-in with sites. And from there, I emailed other societies of critical care and WIFPIX even put a recruitment tool on their website and, you know, to find site investigators who are interested to participate. From there, things really took off. People wanted to connect, collaborate, and it seemed like this topic struck a nerve. Well, that's excellent. And, you know, with that, let's dive into the International Survey of Critically Ill Children and Acute Neurological Insults. And maybe you could talk us through a little bit of your main results, what you found. Was there anything that surprised you as you were evaluating your data? Thank you. I'd love to talk about the main study that was published a few years ago. These data were collected mostly in the year of 2012. So they're, of course, on the old side now as things move fast. However, I think that we can still learn a lot by re-looking at it. So over the course of four days throughout a one-year period, you know, to account for seasonal changes, we were able to engage with 107 PICUs in 23 different countries 
Mind you, 80% of them were from North America or Europe, but we were able to look at basically the prevalence, the treatments, the monitoring tools, and the outcomes of children at hospital discharge and up to three months later, children who had conditions like traumatic brain injury, cardiac arrest. The main findings is that the prevalence of all these acute neurologic conditions we looked at was 16%. So that doesn't mean that that many children are coming in a day. It's not an incidence number necessarily, but these children tend to have sometimes longer hospital lengths of stay. So it's really, when you look at the ICU, how many children had these conditions on that day? Of the 924 children that were enrolled in this study, 23% had cardiac arrest, 19% had traumatic brain injury. Regionally, however, the most common condition was central nervous system infection or inflammation. And that was in South America, Asia, and the single African site that participated from South Africa. All-cause mortality at hospital discharge was 12%. Cardiac arrest patients had the highest mortality at 24%. And children with traumatic brain injury had the most frequent unfavorable outcomes at 49%, which was a composite of either severe disability or death. So I think Pangea really brought to light the massive impact of these acute neurologic conditions in children and potentially a burden on families, although that wasn't studied in this particular study. That was obviously kind of one of the questions that came out of this. How do children and families recover from these events? And I think it really speaks to the need for society at large to invest in clinical and research innovations to try to save more lives and improve more lives. I will mention that uh, this work was funded by the Laerdal Foundation, and those funds supported our web-based data collection tool, which was innovative for me anyway. It also funded a great study coordinator, Carrie Pedro, and some statistical support, which is really important to involve in your studies from the get-go. Our site PIs performed all this work all gratis with sweat equity, which is a quality common to our colleagues in this discipline, but certainly nothing to take lightly. But I think that we're all rewarded with these data and opportunities to mine it for secondary studies. Well, that's exciting. And I'm curious, you know, as you mentioned, this work was done back in 2012, and we now have, you know, better bandwidth, better software programs. You also mentioned, you know, there was maybe a little bit less representation from some more resource limited areas. And I wonder, do you think now if, if you were to repeat this or do additional studies in this way, Do you think there would be opportunities for more buy-in from these areas? And if so, how might you go about in trying to get equal representation? That's a great question, Tracy. It's complex. I think everybody would be interested in participating. But for our colleagues in less resource regions, there's less training to conduct research. There's less resources available to conduct research in terms of coordinators or sometimes participation in web-based activities. It's more difficult sometimes to get IRB approval or it costs money to get IRB approval. And frankly, they spend sometimes most of their time on clinical care so much that they might even have second jobs. You know, in, in my travels, I've discovered a lot of these clinicians have more than one position to support their families. Um, so it makes it really, really a challenge to participate. We were able to get additional funding for Pangea DC or developing countries to conduct a questionnaire over four consecutive weeks where I was able to leverage my relationships with some clinician scientists in four different countries in Kenya, Ethiopia, Rwanda, and Ghana. Amazing partners who got this work done to look really at my interest was um, what is the frequency and what are the hospital resources available and rehab resources available to take care of kids with traumatic brain injury in these regions where trauma was an increasing cause of morbidity and mortality. And we wanted to compare that to a condition that perhaps had more evidence. So we chose CNS infections. And um, what we found was that over four weeks, 58 children had TBI and 72 had CNS infection. The etiology differed by site. Ambulances were sometimes available, but often cost people money. So they took buses or taxis or private cars to get to the hospital. 80% of these children presented with altered mental status, but they came by car or taxi. And then the most common cause of TBI was fall, which it is worldwide for children. A close second was uh, motor vehicle accidents. 9% were due to assault. Etiology was unavailable in 80% of the children with infections because they didn't have proper culturing resources available. 
And what we took from that study in particular was that the investigators at these sites thought these data could inform the development of neurocritical care protocols and guidelines for pre-hospital, hospital, and rehabilitative care, perhaps by resources available. So a more of a tiered approach. You know, we have our amazing severe TBI guidelines that have undoubtedly improved the care for children and in our centers that have all these great resources, trauma teams, helicopters, <laughs> surgeons available 24-7, great ICU care, and great rehabilitation access for most children. But what about kids in the majority of the world where they're having traumatic brain injuries and don't have access to these great tools and people, resources? Well, that is incredibly helpful, Erica. I think you, you pointed out a lot of really important considerations when people are considering doing research um, in the low resource environment and some of the strategies that you might have to get a lot of information without imposing an extra burden on a lot of these clinicians. I'm curious, you know, you've brought up a lot of really interesting points and are you aware of any additional research that's being done? And if so, in which direction is that research going and what's been found so far? Yes. Thank you, Tracy. And I know this won't be a comprehensive review of what's been going on, but I'll point out that Medea Reyes, who's now a PICU clinician at CHOP, former fellow here, has examined in a secondary study of Pangea in developing countries, examined inpatient management and testing and monitoring capabilities in TBI patients. And Dr. Amelie Andre van Arnhem in Seattle is looking to do this in the CNS infection cohort. So people are still mining these data to help inform clinical care and ideas for new innovative research trials. But I'd also like to mention the work of the Policy Global Health subgroup, which is doing fantastic collaborative study in over 100 centers. That's just remarkable to me. What they're looking to do is describe the whole landscape of pediatric critical illness in low and middle resourced regions. They have an incredibly efficiently crafted case report form that was vetted by many people. And they launched last January, and they'll have several abstracts presented at uh, the upcoming Pediatric Academic Society. So look forward to that information. This is unprecedented data to look forward to. That's super exciting. I think we're all waiting for those results. That will be really wonderful to share with this broad community. Thank you for, for those updates on the global health arena. I'm curious if there's other research that you think is necessary building on your success. What do we need to do to sort of make our care better? What what do we know about these illnesses? Mm -hmm. What are the key areas in your opinion that we should be studying more broadly and also in a more focused manner to try to get to some of those answers? Thank you, Tracy. I'm looking forward to the ADAPT results. I think that will be really informative. Now that's a large uh, multi-center trial by Mike Bell looking at the management of TBI in children who have ICP monitors. Beyond that, I think it would be great to be able to collaborate with partners in different resource regions towards the development of more resource-based guidelines. So this could be a combination of evidence-based guidelines with best practices and also tiered towards sites with different resources. And then I think it should be studied, you know, implemented and studied and tweaked. I think we all do better, perhaps, when we at least have some best practices established. And I'm not saying I'm the person to take all of this on, but I would love to be a part of something like this. Great. And you also mentioned a bit um, earlier about um, outcomes and how you know, these illnesses are impacting patients and family in the long term. I know you've done a a lot of work related to that as well. And I wondered if you might speak a little bit about your research in that domain. Yes. um, You know, I have to say that my research umbrella is neurocritical care and outcomes, I would say now. And it's all been a journey, putting together all these pieces, piece by piece. In addition, you know, we brought a group together, thanks to Capcorn and Polisi, Post PICU Outcomes Group to develop the PICU Core Outcome Set. This was really inspired by the need to compare research study outcomes and perhaps collate these multiple small studies that we often publish. And the idea behind the PICU Core Outcome Set was to really think through what are the best outcomes and who decides that? 
we thought it was best to bring in families, bring in researchers, bring in clinicians to really understand what outcomes we should be looking at in our research programs. And also perhaps in our clinical programs, if, if sites are developing post-PICU follow-up clinics and things like that. And so thanks to Capcorn and Policy, especially the outcome subgroup, we're able to pull together a multinational collaborative group. First, we examined what kind of outcomes after discharge were being looked at in the literature already. That was a massive <laughs> effort by the Polisi subgroup. Over 80 people participated in that, re- in that scoping review, now published in Critical Care Medicine. In addition, we performed a qualitative study with teens and parents, asking them about their recovery process. And from that distilled what outcomes might be important to them and what they experienced, their lived experience. And finally, we collated those outcomes and put them together in a modified Delphi questionnaire format. And we asked all these different stakeholders, you know, what were the outcomes most important to you? And we had incredible participation in this Delphi. And what we came up with in the core outcome set were the key domains that people thought were most important. However, there remain a significant number of domains, especially those focused on the family function, that didn't distill out between the clinician, researcher, and family groups, but it was brought to light by the family groups that these were very, very important to them. And it was kind of like screaming for us to do something with with this information. So we created the extended core outcome set and said, these are perhaps emerging to clinicians and researchers, but very important to families to consider for post-discharge outcomes in clinical and research programs. Next up, Aileen Maddox in Colorado and Nithi Pinto at CHOP are leading the effort for the core outcome measure set, which is going to be an incredible resource, I think, for all of us. Again, the Polisi team, they vetted hundreds and hundreds of measures both for these domains in the core outcome set as well as the extended core outcome set, and parse them by their availability, their validity, and cost, and length. So I think that future clinicians and scientists will be able to you know, sort of look at the core outcome set domains, find a measure, and plunk that into their research design, and know that these are important outcomes for everyone. That's really incredible, you know, and I, what I love hearing from about all these studies and this, this journey is it's really been, as you said, a journey, you know, you started with looking at how big the problem is, what are the key factors, you know, what are the, the ultimate outcomes, and then our bit by bit with you and a whole group of lots of amazing collaborators and colleagues looking individually at each of these pieces to try to fill in those gaps and holes and pull in really the entire picture, the clinicians, the families, the whole teams that are working together to improve the care of these kids and building the resources for the future projects and studies that are coming out of there. So I wondered if we could sort of shift gears just a little bit. I, you know, As you were talking earlier about the point prevalence study and some of these larger outcome projects, I couldn't help but think about the role of big data, you know, influencing our research methodologies more and perhaps bringing new opportunities for looking more broadly at at large groups of patients and trying to parse out specific details and challenges that might influence care. And I'm curious if, if you or anybody that you're working with has been thinking about the role of big data for these kinds of research studies. And if so, do you know of any major projects that are underway or any major needs that you can see direct applicability here? I think that's a great question, and it's becoming a big tool that needs to be leveraged in the field of neurocritical care. I can't say that I've been leading effort, but I I work with several who are. For example, Bob Clark, our division chief, along with Alicia Au and Chris Horvat. My other PICU colleagues here are MPIs on an NIH-funded two-center study to leverage EMR data and blood-based biomarkers of brain injury to predict neurologic decline in PICU patients that don't have necessarily have brain injury. They really just kicked off their study in this past year. And I think it's going to be incredibly informative. If you can find a signal that a child is starting to have signs that they're at risk of major neurologic decline and you can prevent it or be more acutely aware of it, imagine the value of that for a clinician and a family. So that's one example. Our pediatric GCS NeuroCOVID Consortium, you know, has leveraged, again, another network 
of investigators around the world who want to contribute to what we can, I guess, during this pandemic. And looking at studies like Recovery in the UK, uh, where they're collecting data in a national basis, they're able to learn faster and publish faster and implement their findings faster. You know, they were the first study to find that steroids might be beneficial in acute COVID-19 disease way faster than if you had, you know, had to prospectively enroll patients individually. And then Derek Angus, who's our department chair, he's led the remap cap study, which is an EMR based platform study with embedded randomized controlled trials that test out the latest and greatest COVID treatments as well. I think that that method is going to become more standard of care, but it's incredibly complex and takes many, many resources to put into place. One of the goals of our GCS NeuroCOVID consortium would be to think about how we could design a platform in which we have simplified case report forms with pre-approved IRB and tissue banks primed to study emerging pediatric neurocritical care questions and perhaps new conditions that come about like SARS-CoV-2. And I know that there are a lot of fellows and junior faculty that are reading your work, like they read a lot of experts in our field and probably are sitting there wondering, how did you get started? How could I also do something like that? And I'm curious if you can provide some insight. You've already given a lot of tips during this podcast, but what were some of the the tips and strategies about um, how you got started, lessons learned, what was involved, any advice that you can share with people that are interested in and doing something similar? Absolutely. You know, you can probably talk for hours about this to anyone who's doing work in um, and find a different story, completely different paths. So that's the one thing to realize is that there's no one direct path. I didn't know I'd be so passionate about including research in my life and in my career. I thought I'd be really happy doing PICU clinically. For me, I asked for a research experience and work with Bob Clark and his team at the Saffer Center. And I learned so much from this multidisciplinary group of researchers, from lab technicians participating in journal club, and really understanding the why, why certain things happened after brain injury. They were being discovered right before our eyes. Really doing some work in the lab helped inform my way of approaching clinical questions. I learned that I didn't just want to, you know, study epidemiology. I wanted to understand why things happened. I wanted to delve into what goes into an outcome. So one question begets another. I was lucky in that I was in a place that had fantastic mentors in the field that I was interested in neurocritical care, both clinically and and from a research perspective. Here, our division chief, it was his mission, first Ann Thompson's mission, then Bob Clark's mission to support an academic faculty. So I had a lot of freedom to pursue research questions that I thought were interesting, that were also necessary to the field. They were fundable and doable. I think you you really have to align yourself with all those things. It really helps to have a great mentoring team. I was incredibly lucky to benefit from mentors and sponsors like Pat Kohanek, who's the director of the Saffer Center, Bob Clark, who is a great expert in pediatric brain injury, as well as people like um, Scott Watson, who is really one of my my first clinical research mentors here in Pittsburgh. And I went to Polisi and I, I listened to Martha Curley talk about her pitfalls and pearls and dealing with randomized clinical trials, Adrian Randolph and how she did translational research and Scott Watson and what went into an outcome. So I listened and what I really did was just think about what I was most passionate about. I got extra training, got a master's degree in clinical research, and frankly, just went to work. I worked on building networks and respecting people's time and effort and sharing the academic rewards and really appreciating and acknowledging those collaborations is important to doing any future work. I guess at this point in my career, I've been mentoring a lot of trainees, medical students, some residents, a lot of fellows, and I really enjoy giving back and helping develop trainees in the direction in which they want to go. That's really a pleasure. And I learn a lot from them, it turns out, uh, because they have different interests. 
So I think you always have to be curious. You always have to be open to learning new methods like these big data methods. I might not be leading the pack, but I'm learning from my more junior colleagues that seem to be becoming experts um, in this, using this as a tool. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a real pleasure speaking with you. And I know I learned a lot from you today. So, um, so thank you so much. Thank you, Tracy. It was really wonderful to join you. This has been a production of Open Pediatrics. Check out the description box to view the resources and journal articles referenced in this podcast. To hear more podcasts like this one, log on to openpediatrics.org.